Hi, Emily. Welcome to the show. Um, we're really pleased to have you on Runners Connect today to uh, talk about nutrition um, as well as your own running and, and definitely help our audience uh, learn a little bit more about how they can make uh, better nutrition decisions for themselves. So thanks for taking the time on your day to, to share with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be working for Runners Connect and uh, getting out there talking to your population. So Awesome. Great. It should be fun. Exactly. Um, so to get started, for, uh, for those of our audience who are listening who don't know who you are, um, give us a little bit of a background in terms of like your running history, some of your accomplishments, uh, maybe how you got into the sport, um, those types of things. Okay. Um, basically, I ran um, ran for uh, the U of M Gophers, University of Minnesota. Got recruited to run for them from uh, my high school in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. So I kind of made the the leap across the boundary. <laughs> here in Minnesota for a good ten years now. Um, okay. Went from being um, all American in college to getting recruited by a local team, uh, Team USA Minnesota, mm -hmm. a group of uh, elite distance runners, kind of um, an Olympic training program of sorts, um, funded by USATF, kind of one of those um, distance um, training groups that you see throughout the country. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, you know what the Hansons and um, all the groups. So, I decided to stay here and run with them. And um, that's kind of opened up new opportunities in terms of running and also um, getting my nutrition practice out there, which has been really cool. Um, so that's what I studied in college was um, just dietetics, basically. Mm -hmm. But I started off in pharmacy, okay. switched to med, and then through that realized that I never really learned chemistry and your basic sciences well enough to stick with those routes. So I okay. kind of switched the focus to food and how food plays a role in sport and physiology and all that kind of cool stuff. And that's what stuck. Okay. So, so you um, started that kind of in your, well, started in kind of more your college undergrad, um, yeah. kind of the interest in it, and then uh, kind of continued to pursue it. Yeah. So it's the one that um, I feel most comfortable with. You kind of get to use all the different realms of uh, – health sciences you have a lot of pharmacy in it still mm -hmm. um the basic physiology of running and exercise and um then just the internal health stuff you know um, food is really important not just to athletes but to the population in general and it causes a lot of diseases but it can also help prevent and cure a lot of diseases so i think that's the fun part about nutrition is it applies to everybody and it also plays a really functional role in sport and optimum performance mm -hmm. Um, so after you uh, finished your undergrad, um, you continued in in school, correct? You went to get your master's or you're still getting yeah, your master's? I'm still there right now. I finished classes about three years ago. Uh, <laughs> I've just been working on my master's project since then. It's really a basic write-up that I haven't finished doing. Um, you know, life kind of gets in the way and I yeah. uh, just got to make that last step to finalize it. But um, So that will be for a master's in public health. Okay. Um, I'll share something funny with you. I'm sure you'll appreciate. Um, so I am literally my results section away from getting my master's. I, I pretty much all I have to do is write my results section, and it's been about a year. So okay. um, just for a results section, just more, you know, kind no, of. No, that's busy, where I'm so. at too. Results <laughs> section. Yeah. So um, I'm years, sure you can appreciate. So. <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. So so tell me a little bit about. You said it's a master's in public health. How does that kind of incorporate with the nutrition that you kind of went over? You know, kind of. I guess what people consider sports nutrition. How does that carry over? And and you what know, you do? it doesn't. It doesn't carry over exactly to sports nutrition. Um, I think the reason I chose public health over a master's of science initially was that I had spent so much time in the master's of science program already. I took a few graduate classes as an undergraduate and kind of felt if I was going to stay at the same school, I needed to get exposed to maybe a different part of nutrition. Mm -hmm. And I chose public health um, particularly because I noticed that nutrition in our schools is starting to play a key role into where our population goes as adults and just seeing how big of a problem obesity is and the health consequences that come with that, you know, you have diabetes and high mm -hmm. blood pressure, heart disease, and all those things that are really affecting um, America and our culture. I kind of figured, you know what, I got sports nutrition. Oh, that's a specialized population. We can come back to that. But just kind of getting more well-rounded in how can what I do um, help the American population 
and uh, you know, people more in general. And I think um, maybe a lot of people that will visit this website are new runners and people that are looking to get healthy starting with exercise. So that's, yeah. you know, I think the two realms can kind of come together there. And that was probably the, the impetus for me going towards public health is just to see how I can involve what I do in sports with the general population. And I think they mix together really well. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, just, you know, obviously working with a ton of athletes, you know, um, you know, most people think of runners, especially if they haven't started running yet, you know, like, oh, there's these, these fitness freaks and, um, you know, just crazy fast and good and everything. But, you know, the majority of runners that we work with are, you know, pretty, you know, kind of started running a little bit later in life and maybe did it or usually did it because they needed, they had some type of health problem that mm -hmm. they needed to, to fix. So I think that's a great uh, way to come at it in two different ways, you know, being able to look at the, the public health side as well as, you know, the sports side where, you know, yes, they are training for a marathon. So they need to get that sports nutrition right, but they also need to, you know, control their diabetes and their blood sugar and those types of things. So Yeah, and I think the two work really well together. It's really fun to see somebody that just started off running, um, not only see the health benefits that they've gained through that, but then also get a new perspective on eating and mm -hmm. see how that can change their life too. And, you know, a lot of um, – people that we might call recreational runners or, or, or sub elite are actually a lot healthier mm -hmm. than a lot of elite athletes that I run into. Um, no, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was, I wrote a blog post uh, just the other day about, um, well, one of the things I tried to do when I was training for the marathon was I was always worried about running with a full stomach and getting cramps and stuff like that. So um, I have an affinity for donuts and I would eat two donuts and like a glass of milk before my second runs just to get used to like something in my stomach. And uh, I certainly could have chosen a better food product than donuts to to be eating to sit in my stomach. But um, but yeah, definitely sometimes not the not the healthiest. But yeah, it happens. <laughs> like I, I I'll probably mention. I, I think people could be somewhat appalled at what I eat, and we're not viewed in on my kitchen right now. But if we were, <laughs> we might not uh, be too thrilled. <laughs> so um, I, I think it's interesting. Um, but uh, I think also one of the hardest things to do is you talk to doctors and nurses too, and you see them out smoking, mm -hmm. knowing that smoking is a bad thing. It's right. been proven in science that it's, it's not very good for your health, but it's so hard to counsel yourself with what you have. Mm -hmm. So, if, you know, if I were to turn my diet around, I'd be going to somebody else in my field and, and asking mm -hmm. them for their help. So <laughs> Yeah, no, I get the same thing, um, you know, as, as a coach, as a running coach, you know, people ask me like, you know, did you coach yourself? And I'm like, no way, because, yeah. you know, I, I tell people things and I'm very good about being patient and, uh, you know, kind of relaxed with training. But like when it comes to myself, I'll over train myself every time. And yeah. um, but, you know, when it comes to somebody else, I just have that perspective. So I know what you're coming from. Mm -hmm. Um, but let's talk about your running background a little bit. Um, let's, uh, what, what, what are some of your PRs now? And, and I know, I know you kind of focus more on shorter events in the sense, kind of like 5k steeplechase, but, uh, talk about some of your accomplishments. Well, um, so I'm on a progression up right now, not towards the marathon necessarily. Um, but you're right. I came from steeplechase 5k when I was, um, just out of college and, um, set PRs in just about everything I ran my first year out of college. I did a 437 mile, um, a 946 or 945 steeplechase, okay. um, which was an Olympic A standard that year and in 2008. And then I went on to do a 1519 5K um, uh, later that year. Then ended up getting a stress fracture in my back and um, running a five, the 5K five at the trials, but not moving on to the next round or anything like that. Um, and then from there, I, I moved towards um, 8K cross country. A mm -hmm. um, couple of years after that, did my first 10K. Um, I don't even remember what my 10K PR is. I think it's 33 flat okay. for, for 10K. And then um, just recently, I um, run the half marathon. And I did a one twelve forty four this year at um, Grandma's Half in Duluth. Nice, nice debut. So, yeah. Um, and in, in cross country, you had some success. I think it was in two thousand nine, two thousand ten. Yeah, two thousand nine. I think it was in um, out in Maryland is when mm -hmm. I I was uh, the U.S. champion there. Very um, cool. And then the year before that, I placed third, and um, then eighteenth in the world at World Cross that year. 
Wow. So 18th in the world. That's not too bad. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't too bad. That was kind of fun. So um, that's, yeah, that's kind of where my running's at right now. Kind of, um, well, I guess I should also mention a, a couple years back, I was diagnosed with exercise asthma okay. or something of that sort that we haven't really figured out to date. So it's been difficult to do those higher intense runs like uh, the steeplechase or the 5K. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been kind of catering my training more towards the longer races that I can withstand a lower intensity, but for a longer duration of time. And okay. um, so the 10 milers and um, half marathons have kind of fit that bill for me lately. Okay. Um, actually, interesting, but I, this is kind of off the cuff, but um, talk a little bit about the exercise-induced um, asthma because I coach a few runners who uh, may have that or at least are exhibiting symptoms of that. Um, so I think it may be something that uh, other audience uh, listeners here are, are interested in. Um, you don't have to go too much into that, but, uh, you know, what are some of the symptoms and, you know, what can people look out for from, from your experience? I know you're not uh, necessarily a specialist, but... Yeah, um, just from my experience when I first started noticing it, it was um, after I had been um, recovering from a respiratory infection that I decided to race through and train through, and I think that made some kind of adaptations in my lungs where they were starting to react to negatively to exercise and different weather elements and everything like that. So I remember just um, being in 5K races later that year and kind of having blackout and not being able to breathe just kind of, you know, the lungs closing in mm -hmm. and a lot of wheezing and, and things like that, symptoms that I couldn't really describe specifically. I just knew that they were happening. Mm -hmm. And so from that, I went and got all the, the asthma testing done and everything. And it came up as nothing because, shocker, a runner has really good lungs to begin with. <laughs> my breathing test came up as normal. It, you know, I had to go to a different doctor that said, well, that's not normal as an elite runner, though. You know, it's okay. not for for an uh, everyday person, but um, they're definitely depressed from where they should be. Um, so I, I, I got on a number of medications and different um, inhalers and stuff, and sometimes it would work and sometimes it wouldn't. So it was just kind of a, more of a playing around with my training um, in a way that it wouldn't affect my lungs too bad where I couldn't come back the next day or the next week and, and do another workout. Okay. So that's just kind of been the progression it's been since then. I don't really take any medications for it anymore. Um, maybe just a rescue inhaler before hard workouts and things like that. But okay. trying to make the training more adaptable to the condition that mm -hmm. might not, you know, improve or go away. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. I'm yeah. sure that's helpful. And uh, actually, it's a great point. We'll probably have an expert on and maybe have you back on sometime to talk a little bit more about it, your experiences with it. Yeah, um, I'll know if it gets better. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, so let's get into a little bit of the nutrition stuff. Um, I guess I want to start with something that you kind of already brought up briefly, um, kind of your own nu nutrition um, in, in two different ways. And, and one is I, I saw an interesting uh, an interview with you in Running Times after you, I think it was after the um, your 18th place finish at the um, World Cross Country Championships, in which you said, from the, from the article at least, quote, uh, when I go out to dinner with people, I'm kind of the worst case scenario because I'm both a professional runner and a nutritionist. So I have to deal with people sitting there and I feel like they're critiquing what I'm eating and they're uncomfortable eating in front of me. So, you know, how do you approach your own, you, you know, your own nutrition and, um, and, you know, and how is that, and how is your knowledge of nutrition kind of changed the way you, way you approach your own, um, fueling? It, the, the funny thing is if I go out to dinner, like I don't have a whole lot of supplementary income. So if I'm out to dinner, I'm not going to pay $12 for a salad. Like, I'm going to get the cheeseburger with fries and a beer because that's what I'm out. You know, I'm already mm -hmm. out, and that's kind of what I'm in the mood for. And okay. so it just so happens that I'm out with people that don't see me every day, and they're like, oh, you're an elite runner, and you're a dietitian, and this is what you're choosing to eat. And it's like, well, yes, in this context, that's what I'm choosing to eat. Um, but in general, I think over time I've developed a, a pretty healthy approach to nutrition and one of the very first things I was ever taught is that everything's okay in moderation. Mm -hmm. And usually people are going to apply that to, well, that just means the bad foods, like mm -hmm. the snacks and the burgers and, you know, pizza and all that, all that kind of stuff. But you have to moderate your, what you would consider to be healthy choices too, because you can't sit there and just eat lettuce and vegetables all day and not eat other stuff. So you have to 
really use a sense of moderation with everything that you're you're putting into your diet. So that was kind of my approach to it is it's yes, I'm having a, a cheeseburger and fries tonight, but that's because my workout is done. You know, I, I centered my good eating around my workouts. Mm-hmm. And then for the rest of the day, I, I say I just kind of fill in the gaps. So it's like, well, what am I missing in my diet so far? And mm-hmm. it might be I haven't had any red meat today. So I'm going to have a burger. It might be I haven't had any vegetables yet. So I'm going to have, you know, a pretty big serving of vegetables. And that's how I approach my nutrition is I, I say, you know, my workout is the most important part of the day. So I'm going to center, you know, really good sound sports nutrition principles around that workout. Mm-hmm. And then once that's complete, then it's just kind of filling in the gaps to meet my daily needs with the other stuff. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense, actually. And uh, to be honest, that's how I approached my nutrition when I was training was, you know, there were certain specific times a day or, or aspects where I would really, really kind of really focused on it. Um, but then outside those windows, I was a little bit more relaxed. Um, yeah. And part of that for me, and, and probably the same with you, is when you're running a lot, you have to take in a lot of fuel. Mm-hmm. Um, and so at some point, it just becomes impossible to eat, like, just carrots and lettuce and, you know, healthy foods all the time because yeah. you're just so many, you know, you're taking in so many calories. Um, we had uh, Camille Heron on last week, uh, who is a, a Olympic trials marathoner. And, you know, she was saying, you know, she probably eats close to 4,000 calories a day because she's running 120, 130 miles a week. And when you're running that much, it just, you know, you, you can't put all the fuel, you know, back in with just, you know, vegetables. So I think that's a really great approach. Mm. Um, and second, um, you know, do you feel like that more relaxed um, approach to nutrition uh, benefits you from not stressing out too much about it and getting worked up? Because um, I know for me, that's that was a big part of it. Um, and as an elite athlete who, you know, your performances are so important, does that help you kind of keep less stress about it and stuff like that? Yeah, I, nutrition is a very important tool for training. Um, you can't neglect that, but at the same time, you don't want to waste too much mental energy thinking about it. Um, and the same goes for with your training. So if you show up on the, the start line for a 5K, you can't be thinking about, oh, I wish I would have done one more mile repeat. Like, I wish I could do that now and get that in there. Because you can't, the training's already done, and the same is true for your nutrition. You can't get to the start of a of a race line and be fretting about what you wish you would have ate or not ate. Um, you know, you just can't. You have to trust that you did the right things and, and everything's going to be okay. And I think it stems back to when I was in high school, and I was a captain for the cross-country team, and I'd have a teammate come up to me crying. And I'm just like, we're about to start the race. What are you crying about? And she's like, well, I, I had milk on my cereal this morning, and it's going to make me sick. And it's, you know what? It's going to make you sick if you think it's going to make you sick. Mm-hmm. But if you think that it's going to make you strong and give you energy, then it's going to make you strong and give you energy. So you really have to, to think about how much mental energy am I willing to waste thinking about eating the right or wrong things mm-hmm. or how can I flip that around to saying, you know what, you did a good job for yourself. You're fueled, you're ready to go. And it doesn't matter which way you fueled yourself. It, mm-hmm. Energy is energy. Um, it comes in many different forms, but the bottom line is when it's in our body, it's, it's the energy that it's going to be. It's not different depending on any kind of food we put in. So right. just kind of making the best of where we got our energy from and, and trusting that it's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, for, the, for the clients that you work with when you do nutrition consulting, you know, is that kind of the approach that you take with them? Um, and I'm just curious if it's different coming from somebody who may already be in an unhealthy eating situation, um, you know, from a, a health standpoint, or just the fact that maybe they're, um, you know, already eating so unhealthy, you know, how do you, how do you approach um, coming, working with somebody, um, you know, who isn't an elite athlete? Yeah, um, the, the big thing is you don't want to make – too many major changes at once. You don't want to completely overhaul somebody's diet because there's no way they're going to stick with it then. Mm-hmm. You can't take somebody who eats cheeseburgers and pizza and put them on salads only. Mm-hmm. So what I try to do is that when I get food records from somebody, I look at consistency about which foods they se- seem to really like mm-hmm. and do as best as I can to keep those in there because really all foods work in a sports nutrition diet. It's just a matter of how you're fitting them in around the workouts and then the amount of those foods that show up in your daily intake. Mm-hmm. So um, for one example, I had a client that I saw a few times a week, she would have um, these cookies and 
she'd have them out because she was out driving or whatever and they were they were easy they were convenient and I found a way to keep those cookies in the diet plan because um, you know they're a comfortable staple in there they may not be the best thing you know they're sugar and fat and not all great things but they still are energy uh -huh. and so I, I still find a way to make those work in the diet and then add in other healthy stuff that is going to have more of an influence than just this one package of cookies is going to have. So okay. keeping those things that are comfortable and, and make you feel like, you know, this diet isn't so hard, like I can still have my cookies. Mm -hmm. I think that's an easier transition into a, a healthier lifestyle then. Um, and then you just kind of work with the other stuff too. So, so say you need to limit sodium a little bit. Mm -hmm. You can work within the foods that are already eating to do that, either by choosing a lower sodium or just reducing the portions and things like that. So, okay. um, and that makes it my job easier too, because I'm not just trying to come up with these foods out of nowhere that I don't know if you eat them or not mm -hmm. and, and throwing those in your menu, but, but working with what you have and helping you find a way that, that you can make those work. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a great point. Um, one of the, there's a book, it's called the four hour body. It's uh, by a guy named Tim Ferriss who wrote a more famous book called the four hour work week. Um, and one of the things that he talks about and then I agree with is, you know, having a cheat day and, you know, and I guess diff people different approach kind of relaxing about their nutrition in different ways. And that's how I've always looked at it is that, you know, one or two days a week, you know, I kind of just relax about nutrition and um, I find it much easier to stay on a diet uh, or I don't necessarily diet, but, you know, kind of stay on a healthy eating pattern when I have those one or two days where I'm just like, you know, it's okay, eat whatever you want. Um, and it sounds like that's kind of how you approach things too, where you want to make sure that people stay on a healthy diet consistently and not just go, you know, three weeks of like really clean, healthy eating, nothing but, you know, vegetables and salads and clean stuff and then just stop completely. Um, yeah. I'm assuming that's part of the reason as well. Yeah. And that, that's kind of the paramount of, of sports nutrition is um, it's very much in parallel with physical training where you can't just have one week where you're really good mm -hmm. and then slack off the rest of the month because it's a cumulative effect. Um, mm -hmm. And you can't all of a sudden decide you want to worry about your sports nutrition the night before a race because nothing's going to make up for the months of training that you didn't pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. So I kind of think of the two things in tangent is, well, if I practice healthy eating every day the same way I practice my running every day, then when I get to that day before the race, I don't have to stress too much about it because there's nothing I can do to change it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everything's already kind of been done. And so I'm a big fan of the cheat day, too. I, I take my cheat day as Saturdays after the long run. Mm -hmm. um, and what I tell my clients, too, is if you if that's your cheat day, you make sure that you do the right things before, during, and after your run mm -hmm. to, to be a healthy runner. You know, you want to fuel before, um, get used to the fluids and the foods that you're going to be taking in, in during your long run, and mm -hmm. then make sure you recover. And then the rest of the day is your day to, you know, to take care of what you want to take care of. If you want to go out and have some wings and beer and, and things like that, that, that fits in there. And I mm -hmm. think it's important to, to to make sure you take care of your job um, in terms of fueling for sport mm -hmm. and then being a normal person. After. Right. No, that's a great, that's a great point. Um, so kind of moving on, shifting gears just a little bit. Um, you know, let's talk running and weight loss. I know a lot of, a big reason that a lot of people get started with running or at least, uh, you know, even if they're experienced runners, you know, they want they might want to lose weight to help kind of boost their performance. Um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, I know you've written a couple articles about this, but, you know, I guess there's a couple different angles. Why necessarily that um, uh, running might not actually cause you to lose weight, you know, in, in some senses you may actually gain weight. Um, and then kind of a follow-up question, you know, like, where can runners, uh, you know, how can runners tell, you know, where a good weight for them uh, on the scale is, you know, like when dropping some weight might be a benefit or where it might be, deter you know, the, the negative calorie intake might be a de detriment to their performance. Mm -hmm. So let's start with, um, you know, why they might not actually lose weight and what they should be looking for. Sure. Um, so we kind of talked about this with the marathon training too, is you, you think, okay, I'm adding a lot of miles, I'm exercising more, and the weight's not coming off. So let's think about the good reasons that could happen. One good reason can be that you've never worked out before or you were sedentary for, for quite a while and now you're starting this exercise routine and your body's going to adapt to that by building muscle. So what we're doing, you know, when we're running, we're breaking down muscle and rebuilding it. And so that's one of the first adaptations that's going to happen is 
yes, you're running and you're burning calories, but you're also building muscle. And one pound of muscle takes up a lot less room than one pound of fat. So even though we might be dropping fat, we're gaining muscle. So the, the weight's going to be about the same. Um, the other thing is fluid intake um, to support workouts. We're, we're probably bringing in a lot more fluid. Um, and at the same time, we're building muscle glycogen. So what mm -hmm. I talked about in the marathon article was with muscle glycogen storage, we have water storage. And so when you're um, hydrating accurately and putting on muscle or filling up your muscle, muscle glycogen stores, you can expect to gain weight um, okay. just because the glycogen carries water with it. Um, and I think people are shocked to find out how much water actually weighs. Um, you know, one of those small um, one pint bottles of water actually weighs a pound. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you drink two pints of water, which isn't really that hard, that's, you know, four cups of water, mm -hmm. you could theoretically gain two pounds within one minute of drinking water. So, um, you know, I tell people to think of it as kind of like a, a hose. A mm -hmm. hose without water weighs less than it does when you have the water running through it, even though the size of the hose hasn't changed at all. Okay. So, um, you know, there's no need to freak out about that kind of weight gain or or failure to lose weight because mm -hmm. it's just shifts in fluid and gains in muscle which can be good things yeah um, that makes sense then there's the reasons why you might not be gaining weight because of how you are reacting um in terms of the exercise so um i know if i started a marathon program i would say oh man i can eat anything because i'm burning all these calories mm -hmm. and so the problem is the calories we take in are more than the calories that we're putting out and we don't mm -hmm. realize it just because we think that we should eat, eat, eat. And so there's um, 3,500 calories to a pound is about what it is. So you think about if in two weeks you've taken in 3,500 calories more than you put out, mm -hmm. you can gain a pound in two weeks just from over consuming what you need to be your energy needs um also exercise makes you hungrier mm -hmm. so um just naturally you'll be eating more so um those are kind of the main reasons for weight weight gain or failure to lose weight mm -hmm. so i think the more important thing is to look at overall body changes in terms of are my pants fitting tighter or mm -hmm. are they fitting looser um do my muscles look more toned and also, how am I feeling overall? Um, you know, if, if your joints stop aching and you're feeling more energetic, then those are all good adaptations. And, and the numbers on the scales, um, you know, they don't really mean that much. When, I, mm -hmm. when people weigh, I tell them to weigh once a week. That's okay. an issue, too, is I know when people get excited about running to lose weight, they want to be weighing every hour or every day. Right. And, and that's just kind of... Um, you're going to give you a false sense of what's actually happening because weight fluctuates so much. Mm -hmm. It could fluctuate eight pounds within a week, but between that week, if you only weighed once, you might mm -hmm. never see how those eight pounds came on or off or anything like that. So, Right. Now it makes sense, especially if you're looking at it and getting very disappointed or very excited either way. Um, and disappointment being the worst where you get so upset that you either just say, screw it and you don't run that day because you're upset or you know, eat whatever, you're just like, oh, this isn't working. So yeah, yeah I can see that being a problem. Um, one of the things that you brought up too, and I think is, is uh, that I see a lot is kind of, you know, I think you wrote about this too, like sneaky calories, you yeah. know, where, um, you know, I see a lot of running groups, like they'll meet and then they'll go to Starbucks, you know, afterwards. Um, and that's great because, you know, you're kind of continuing the, the long run fun, you know, whatever. But, you know, you have a mocha chino, I don't go to Starbucks, but, you know, yeah. like a mocha chino, yeah. whatever they call them. And it's like, you know, those things are like 1500 calories sometimes. Yeah. And, uh, it's, that's an easy, and you, and I think people are always surprised. And again, you wrote about this and we'll link to this article for anybody that's just listening. If you want to visit the site, uh, we'll have a link to this article that Emily wrote, but, um, uh, you know, I think people overestimate the number of calories that they'll burn, uh, while they're running. And, and that's not to say that they shouldn't be fueling themselves, but, um, again, you know, you drink a thousand calorie, uh, you know, Starbucks type of drink after you run and you, unless you were running really far, you probably barely burn that, um, you know, those amount of calories. Yeah. And that's why I'd say too, is, um, 
to focus your your really sound sports nutrition principles around your workouts. So, you know, you, you fuel adequately before that run, during the run, and then after the run, I don't like to think of that post-run time as party time. That, that's still part of your training, and that's the time when you need to, um, you know, be sound with your nutrition choices. So, you know, have your snack planned out before you even go for that run so that, you know, this is what I'm going to need after my run, uh -huh. and this is what I should have. And then once you've satisfied your energy needs that way, uh -huh. the chances are that you're not going to have those cravings for sweets or something high in calories or something that you see as a treat because your body is going to be satisfied with the right fuel that you gave it, and you can kind of go about a normal day after that. Um, I know it gets exciting to, you know, you see, oh, I just ran 17 miles, like, this is great. The rest mm -hmm. of the day is going to be awesome. I'm going to eat anything I want. Right. But um, that's why I think it's important to have a plan going into that. You know, one of the things that happens to me too is I get done with that long run and I don't have my snack ready. Mm -hmm. I come back to the couch. I'm there for two hours. And then I wake up just ravenous. Mm -hmm. And that's when the day goes south because I'll, it'll be, what can I eat really, really fast? Mm -hmm. And it's usually something like, oh, there's, you know, some snack bars in the freezer or I can pop in this uh, frozen pizza and by right. the time I get done with that I realize I ate way more than I needed to. Right. I feel really sick <laughs> and I didn't really give my muscles what it what they were asking for, you know, mm -hmm. immediately after the run. So right. you know, having that post run plan in place before you even go out is, is a really good thing and it will save you from those empty calories that, that might put you over your limits. Yeah, makes sense. So what can what can people look to be or what should people be trying to eat, you know, post run? Um, what should they be looking at in terms of, you know, both maybe looking at the, uh, the number side of it, you know, like how many grams of protein, carbohydrates kind of thing? And then, you know, what kind of foods do you recommend? Um, one of my go to's is peanut butter and jelly on on white bread. And I say white bread, it doesn't really matter. I just like the taste of white bread. And I think that post exercise is one good time to have those kind of simple sugars um, because your muscles are just wanting to put the glycogen right back in that you've burned through. So within the first 15 to 30 minutes or even up to the first hour is, is an optimal time to start refueling. And mm -hmm. so you think the faster that you can get your blood sugar up, the quicker your muscles are going to be able to take that sugar in. And so I see that as a good time to kind of have sweets or refined sugars or whatever, but still in the sense where it's not like, you know, I'm just going to eat a bag of jelly beans and that would be good. So we're still still trying to focus on some sound nutrition there. So I, I do peanut butter and jelly on white bread. And so I get a, a really good dose of carbs there. And I forget how many grams of carbs that was, maybe like around 80. Okay. Um, and then the peanut butter adds uh, about 8 grams of protein to that. Um, and so um, what science has said is they recommend a, a 4 to 1 ratio of carbohydrates to protein. It's not necessarily um, proven yet that the protein has anything to do with helping muscle glycogen, okay. but it's certainly there to help with muscle repair. Okay. Because glycogen isn't the only thing that's gotten broken down during your workout. You've broken down your muscles too and, and they're going to be hungry for some repair. So having a, a four to one ratio of carbohydrate to protein is a good good way to go about it. Um, also, probably a lot of people have heard this too, chocolate milk is another mm -hmm. good avenue for that, um, just because it's got more carbs through the, okay. the sugar, and then it's still got the, the protein. Um, so the, the numbers kind of depend um, on your body weight, and also how many calories you've burned during that run. Okay. Um, so I don't know those specifically. They're somewhere around here. Um, but even for my own nutrition, I don't really go off of numbers too much. It's it's kind of like what can I get in right away? Okay. And then continuing to eat within the next hour or two. Okay. So it's kind of like an immediate snack, whatever your body can tolerate. A lot of people aren't very hungry after mm -hmm. long runs, so in that sense, it's kind of well, what's easiest. And sometimes that's just going to be a sports drink too. Okay. Um, so kind of whatever's easiest for you to eat at that time. And then within the next hour or two, kind of have a more well-balanced meal with more okay. carbohydrates, more protein. 
So, so in the immediate, like within that 15 to 30 minute window post run, we're really looking at kind of two different um, avenues. We have uh, re replenishing muscle glycogen, and then we have repairing muscle tissue or, or in, in instigating muscle growth. Mm -hmm. And so we, we want to uh, essentially assume simple sugars to kind of inst uh, to re feel the, uh, replenish that glycogen and then bring in the protein to kind of help uh, repair that, start repairing that muscle tissue right away. Mm -hmm. So that's why we do the protein and the um, yep. carbohydrate or glycogen at the same and then time. The protein delays gas gastric emptying as well. Right. So it'll kind okay. of slow down the digestion of that meal and okay. let your sugars sit around a little bit longer so that your muscle still has time to, to pick them up. Okay, so that's yeah. where they kind of work in conjunction yeah. there. Okay. And then, of course, um, especially depending on uh, the conditions we're working out in, we definitely want to be thinking about replacing our fluids and electrolytes, too. Okay. Um, hopefully, we did a good job of doing that throughout the run. But I know I haven't done a marathon, but I know how hard it is to try to take a cup of water and mm -hmm. drink out of it when, you, when you're um, out there hammering away. So if you're like me, you're definitely going to need – to replace your fluids and electrolytes and a sports drink is a good way to do that mm -hmm. um i mentioned the chocolate milk chocolate milk is not going to have all the electrolytes you need okay you might want to be thinking of um something higher in sodium so okay it's a good time to have high sodium foods too and um and then just fluid in general um which you can do with regular water and then foods okay or you can do it through a sports drink okay makes a lot of sense um, so yeah, now that we've kind of gone over a little bit of the post, uh, post run nutrition kind of stuff, um, let's talk a little bit about, um, going back to the original question about weight, you know, is there, how, how do you recommend people look at their own weight when they're trying to assess whether losing a few pounds will help them run faster, um, or whether that's going to be a detriment to their performance? Um, I guess I kind of, I say just take a look at, at the people who are running and, um, in a world where you can see like Chris Solinsky on the same level as uh, I'm trying to think of a really tiny runner, but Mo Farah is pretty small. Yeah, Mo Farah is pretty pretty tiny. So you have two guys with very similar 10k times, mm -hmm. and that has to make you look at and you say, you know what, body weight or body size is not the biggest factor that that plays a role in how I'm able to perform as a mm -hmm. runner, and. Um, so I, I'm a firm believer in the fact that your body has a set weight that it wants to be at. Okay. And that we should let our bodies determine what that's going to be. Um, and that doesn't mean that um, we don't have to pay attention to it because I think, when, especially when you're starting an exercise program and you're thinking healthy and, and losing weight and dieting and all that, you do have to pay attention to make sure that you're still eating enough. Mm -hmm. um, you do have to support your exercise and also just your everyday um, growth, um, w what it takes to keep you living mm -hmm. um, even without doing anything. So um, I think that you can kind of know if, you, if you're dieting too much or if you're not eating enough food. And um, that's when you're starting to experience the general fatigue that's more than just being tired from running. Mm -hmm. It's kind of that everyday fatigue where it's hard to get out of bed, it's hard to go to work, it's hard to concentrate. That Those are kind of telltale signs that your body's lacking in either energy or vitamins and minerals or a combination of both. Okay. Um, so if for runners that are trying to lose weight, you know, what's the caloric deficit that you recommend? How many, uh, for people that don't know what that is, like how many calories do you recommend they cut from their daily or weekly um, uh, nutritional intake? To, to try to lose that, that weight? I recommend no more than a pound a week. Okay. Which would be 500 calories a day. Okay. Um, to get to 3,500 calories um, in that seven days. So, And that can be done through a combination of both working out and eating less. Um, okay. It doesn't have to come from just one or the other. So um, so you find out how many calories you need just to support your daily activities mm -hmm. and then you can burn 250 calories through working out so mm -hmm. that could be a three mile run and then you can also eat 250 calories less to get to your 500 for that day okay um or another you know it, and it really depends on what's the easier way for you to look at it mm -hmm. so another way you can go about is saying i need this many calories just to support my daily activities 
plus this many to support my run. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try to stay 500 calories under that. Okay. Um, in terms of how much food I eat. Okay. So just so, kind of different ways to look at it. Yeah. Um, so for, for people that are interested in that, we'll, uh, at the bottom of this interview, again, if you, if you head to runnersconnect.net and look at our interviews, we'll throw up a calculator for people. Um, it's pretty simple, you know, it's not very individual, 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 not very individual, <laughs> but um, it does, what it'll do, what it'll do is take your basal um, metabolism and then add that to generally what you'll burn per, per mile that you run. Um, mm -hmm. It kind of give you a total calories for the day. That way you can see pretty easily um, what that number, what that your daily caloric burn is. So you can calculate, you know, if you need, if you want to lose 500 uh, calories per day, what that number would be for you. Yeah. So we'll throw that up at the bottom for people that uh, are looking. So, and I'll, I'll say this too. I wish that numbers were perfect. <laughs> it was a calorie and you burned exactly how many it said you were going to burn mm -hmm. and all that. And these numbers are just predictions. They're just estimates and they're right. the best tools we have. Um, the best accessible tools we have short of actually being able to use a direct calorimetry and, and calculate how many calories are actually burning mm -hmm. at rest and exercise and all that. But they're really good equations for just getting an idea of how much you need. And even in the foods you eat, the calories aren't perfect. In right. fact, the calorie labels aren't perfect. One, uh, you know, one egg McMuffin is going to have 350 calories. Another one might have 400 calories. And, so, you know, nothing is, is perfect about these numbers, but if you, if you take them with that perspective, knowing that this is an estimate mm -hmm. and I just want to be somewhere within this range, you're going to be good. So right, don't exactly. fret too much about every exact little calorie or number. Right. Um, just try to stay, you know, within the zone. Okay. Um, so for runners that you begin work, new clients that you begin working with, um, what are, what are some of the biggest, like, what are the most, some of the most common mistakes that you see, uh, runners and just people in general making with their nutritional, um, priorities? Um, uh, wrote my notes down in this somewhere. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, very interestingly, one of the biggest things I see in, um, you know, this could just be a factor of, of common underreporting of food intakes and forgetting things and stuff like that. But I see um, carbohydrate intakes that are, are really low compared to what recommendations would say would be optimal for an endurance athlete okay. um, taking part in a training program. So, um, and to counteract that, I see protein intakes that are generally pretty high. So I okay. think that's kind of how happening in our culture right now is we've been really high on protein um, over the past decade or so. Mm -hmm. And because our protein intakes are so high, it affects our ability to eat enough carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. Not because we're ignoring carbohydrate necessarily, but just because we get so filled up on protein that we don't, you know, have enough space to eat enough carbohydrate. Okay. So yeah, that makes sense. You're probably just full from just protein. Maybe not food. enough carbohydrate that would be um, useful to use for endurance exercise. Okay. Um, do you, do you have a specific number in terms of, you know, what the carbohydrate intake for, um, for an endurance athlete would be? So I go off of the sports nutrition recommendations from the American Dietetic Association. Um, and their recommendation is five to seven grams per kilogram for just general training needs. Okay. Which I would say probably applies to you if you're starting a new exercise program or if you're early in your training season and just doing your base my, miles. Okay. So um, I have that number written down somewhere. So, um, for example, for somebody who's 125 pounds, mm -hmm. that's going to be about 280 to 400 grams of carbohydrate a day. Okay. And that's for general training needs. And in a lot of the clients I have, I don't see anywhere near those numbers. Okay. I see like 150, 250. So really kind of low on the carbohydrate scale. So okay. um, 300 grams of carbohydrate is going to be about 1,200 calories. So if okay. you consume a 2,000 calorie diet, I think that's somewhere around like 65% or something. Okay. I'll trust that your math range. on that. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's the, the funny thing too is um, we don't really use percentages anymore. That's how it used to be given to us is we should have 55 to 65% carbohydrate. Okay. But it's really the absolute totals of carbohydrate that make the most sense. Okay. Uh, because if you if you eat a thousand calories a day, 
and 65% of those calories are, are from carbohydrate, well, that's really not enough carbohydrate to support your training needs and not enough calories in general, to be honest. Okay. So, um, so five to seven grams of carbohydrate for just basic training, like less than 50 miles a week. Okay. And then once you get into the more intense training par- programs and you're doing high mileage for marathon or something like that, mm-hmm. it's going to be somewhere of around seven to 10 grams okay. per kilogram, um, which can really get to high amounts, you know, almost 600 grams a day. And those numbers will be kind of hard to reach um, for some people. And so one of the things to keep in mind too is, is these numbers are for kind of a generic person. So okay. if you're a heavier runner, you want to be shooting more towards the low end of those ranges. And then if you're a smaller runner, kind of more towards the middle upper ends of those ranges. Okay. Um, so, um, so, so how do you recommend, cause I know, um, I work with a few athletes who are, are training pretty hard and they struggle to get in those amount of carbohydrates. And it's something that they always say like, Oh, I know I need to eat more. I know my caloric intake is down, but I'm just not hungry. Yeah. Um, you know, how do you suggest to people that they, they work, kind of work around that that issue so like i said one of the things i do is i structure my carbohydrate around my training Mm -hmm. so going really high carbohydrate before the workout trying to consume um sports drink or if people use gels or even um, actual foods during the run Mm -hmm. and then post run getting really high carbohydrate and again Okay. Um, just from those three meals centered around the workout, mm-hmm. you could get upwards of, of 200 to 300 grams of carbo- carbohydrate in just from centering it around your workout. Okay. Um, and I'm not, I don't want to push sports strength too much because I don't want people to rely strictly on that. Mm-hmm. But when your carbohydrate needs are high and you're working out, that's when the sports beverages can become really useful. Um, you don't want to be drinking them all throughout the day. Um, it's just way too many sugars. But if you center those around your workouts, that then you can get a good dose of carbohydrate in that way. Okay. And then um, just work on concentrating your carbohydrates into your foods. So, um, for example, like dried fruits mm-hmm. are a really small concentrated source of carbohydrate. So making a trail mix with a handful of raisins or dried cranberries and, and stuff like that, um, anything that's a small amount of food but packs a lot of carbohydrate in is going to be nice. Okay. Um, and then dairy products and fruits are another good way to get in carbohydrate as well as vitamins and minerals. Okay. As opposed to doing like jelly beans and ice cream sandwiches and, and things like that that offer the same amount of carbohydrates but not necessarily the same vitamins and minerals that we can get. So, right. Kind of, you know, um, seeing how many birds you can kill with one stone type of thing is like mm-hmm. if I eat a banana, I get mm-hmm. good vitamins and minerals and a lot of carbohydrate as well. Okay. So making those exchanges so that your volume of food is decreased in terms of how much more you need to eat still. Um, along those same lines, um, one thing that I kind of recommend and, and I want to see if, if you agree is, is trying to do more liquid calories. Um, one thing that I would try to do a lot is like, uh, really power pack shakes where I would put, you know, lots of fruits and yogurt and, you know, pretty much all healthy things into a shake and then, you know, blend it all up. And that for me was a great way to get a lot of extra calories because again, it was a lot of, uh, fruits and things like that, which are simple carbohydrates. Um, but it was just in a, in a fluid or more flu- viscous form. So it was a lot easier to, to get yeah. down and not feel like I was full. Yeah, before this interview, I actually had made my fruit smoothie the other day, and usually I'm too lazy to do it, but then I realized <laughs> it doesn't really take a whole lot of time. So what I put in there is I put in a handful of spinach, some orange juice, a container, like a small container of yogurt, and then a cup full of berries, and I mix that all up, and it takes me about five minutes to drink. Mm-hmm. And I sit there and think about how long it would take me to eat each component of that food, <laughs> eat the spinach salad and, and go through a whole cup of berries and yogurt and juice. Mm-hmm. And it makes a lot of sense to just kind of condense it down. And especially for somebody who's busy mm-hmm. out on the road or, you know, is, is just trying to refuel really quickly after their workout. That's a perfect way to do it. Yeah. Not makes a big sense. Component of, of smoothies for sure. 
okay. and, and any kind of liquid. And, and if it's something that you're not making yourself, if you're mm -hmm. buying a processed one, I just encourage you to kind of look at any additives that might be in it. Okay. Uh, you know, extra sugars that they're putting in there. Um, when you make it yourself, you, you have good control over what's going in there, but sometimes, you know, in processing, they, they have to pack things in a lot of, uh, sugars or, or other kinds of preservatives that you could stay away from if you made it yourself. Okay. That makes sense. A good recommendation. Um, so, uh, is that kind of the, the biggest mistake and going back to the original question all the way back is, uh, is that the kind of the biggest mistake you see with. Uh, a lot of the people that you consult with, um, or is there something, is there another thing that you uh, another typically thing is see? Just a, an overall lack of variety. Okay. Um, and I'm guilty of this too. I think a lot of runners are, we kind of get into food ruts. Yeah, I do the same thing. That works. <laughs> and so if, if it's not broke, why fix it? Mm -hmm. But um, variety is really a, a key to a good diet because we're going to get, if we get stuck in food ruts, we might be missing out on some key vitamins and minerals that pretty soon we're going to start to get deficient in. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you don't have to change things up every day, but just kind of throughout the week doing different things. Um, I mean, it could be as simple as one day I make a sandwich on wheat bread and the next day I use like a whole grain tortilla or something, just kind of changing up small components of your usual diet. Mm -hmm. And And one way I like to do that too is, um, if I buy a bunch of fruit at the supermarket, it just kind of sits there mm -hmm. and I forget to eat it. Okay. So I'll get two or three different kinds of fruit at once, like one kiwi, one apple, one banana. And when those are gone, I'll go back and try different kinds of other fruits instead of having like eight apples sitting in my fridge because then it's just apple, 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 and I get tired of it. So, um, you know, just kind of changing up your stimulus that way is you know, trying a different kind of fruit a few days a week and, and things like that. And mm -hmm. getting those kind of varieties in there is a good way to make sure because nutrition isn't just a one day thing. It, like we said before, it, it adds up over the days and the week. So you don't have to worry about, okay, this day I need to do this and this day I need to do that. Just think about in the week in general, how can I vary my nutrition a little bit so that I, I make sure I'm getting a little bit of everything. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I guess that'll roll into our next segment. And this is something new that we're doing um, for this interview is we actually opened up our, our Facebook and Twitter accounts and asked people questions that they wanted to ask Emily and, and questions that we've, they've had. Um, and some of them we've already uh, uh, asked and answered. I know Jamie asked about uh, carbohydrate intake and, and Emily did a great job of covering that. Um, we also um, had a question about what type of food to eat during, uh, or I should say before and after runs, and, and Emily has covered that pretty well. Um, but along the same lines of what Emily just asked, uh, Adam asked us, um, you know, what types of uh, vitamins and supplements uh, does Emily recommend? And do they find that, does she find that they're uh, kind of worth it? Um, and I've always wondered that too, you know, is a multivitamin supplement or any supplements that are on the market, are they worth the money? Um, you know, what do you recommend? Um, I guess I'll just start by saying I'm not a huge fan of supplements only because um, I know for myself I would start to see them as a shortcut. Um, so the amount of supplements that are out there right now kind of reminds me of watching Saturday morning TV with infomercials and seeing just all this wide array of, of products, one of them being the ab belt which I never actually bought, but seemed awesome. You put this thing on for five minutes and you get a six pack. That would and be pretty sweet if it worked. That would be awesome. <laughs> I think about supplements almost in the same light sometimes is they're great that, that we kind of figured out how we can get vitamins and minerals into a pill form and use them as healthful enhancements to our diet. But I fear that they might start taking the place of, you know, hard work. So, for instance, the ab belt, you, they say you can wear that and get six-pack abs, or you could go exercise and be healthy and, and get six-pack abs that way. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I've, I've had a negative view on supplements is just I know that for myself, I would start to think of those as the easy way out. Mm -hmm. so, you know what? I don't like broccoli all that much, so instead I'm just going to take a multivitamin and I don't have to eat any fruits and vegetables then because this multivitamin says it gives me 100% of everything. Right. So I would rather, you know, make a commitment to having a balanced diet 
and, and trying it that way mm -hmm. versus seeing supplements as a way to say, well, I don't need to worry about that then. Um, also, I'm uncomfortable with supplements, um, not so much the vitamins and minerals, but more specifically supplements that are um, touted as muscle gaining or fat burning and, and things like that, that when you start to see the words like propriety blend or, mm -hmm. you know, secret recipe and stuff like that, that's when I start to get concerned is because um, supplements aren't regulated in the same way that over-the-counter drugs and medications are. Okay. And so a lot of times they're not going to get taken off the market or even investigated until something starts going wrong with them. I just read a fact sheet today about um, the role of, of investigating supplement use in Olympic athletes because there's been a lot of athletes that have tested positive for stimulants and steroids and hormones and things that you can believe them or not believe them. A lot of them, well, everyone's going to say that they didn't do it. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these people, maybe they're just trying to take a multivitamin and it had a steroid in it because it's manufactured in the same plant that does, um, you know, steroid powders or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, who, who might be tested any day, it's not worth it to me to, to risk that. Let's let that be in somebody else's control, what right. I'm putting into my body. Um, I guess, there, and then, so there's a few times, though, when, when supplements might be a good thing. Okay. Um, I have a, so uh, some of the key ones that runners usually take will be calcium, mm -hmm. iron, um, vitamin D, okay. and fish oil supplements are another big one. Okay. So um, I'll preface this by saying I, I don't know each individual person. We kind of get, got at that before is everybody's got their own individual health history Mm -hmm. And I can't know any of that. So supplements are something that really should be discussed with your doctor. Or if you're on a medication, discuss it with your pharmacist. Okay. Because there can be a lot of interactions that happen. And, and you think that, well, vitamin or mineral is generally benign. Mm -hmm. But even the foods that we eat can interact with our medications and um, things like that. So it's something that you want to talk with your doctor real quick about. And um, just make sure that there's not going to be any kind of interactions like that. Okay. Um, so, um, iron is a, is a popular one, um, especially with female athletes. Um, our needs are a little bit higher mm -hmm. for iron and, um, iron deficiency can really be detrimental to performance. Yeah. Um, and a well, lot of times you don't know you're iron deficient until it's too late. Right. Right. And then you're out for months trying to resupplement that iron. So if you find it difficult to get iron through food sources like red meats, um, or, or dark poultry meat and, and those kind of sources. And um, you think iron is going to be a problem. It's something to definitely talk to the doctor about and say, you know, does an iron, iron supplement fit into my healthy diet? Mm -hmm. Am I able to do that? Um, yeah, just uh, real quick on that. Um, first, we, we have a pretty extensive article on iron that we'll link to at the bottom of this, uh, this interview. Um, but one thing that I always recommend to athletes is uh, during times that, um, and I'm sure you've done this, is during times where they're feeling good and things are healthy and they're not training quite as much, where maybe they're coming off a break and just getting back into things, is, and if they're worried about iron, especially as a female, is to get their iron levels checked. Um, and that way they can establish a baseline. Um, because everybody's going to have a different natural iron level. What you know, and some people are just naturally high, and, and some people are going to naturally be low. And so, if you can establish a baseline for yourself, um, you have a much better uh, chance of determining whether you might be high or, if, especially low. You know, if you may be low, um, if you have a baseline of like when you're normally healthy and feeling good um, and not excessively training, um, and then you have a, a nice uh, a nice thing to compare it with. So, Definitely. something that I recommend is, yeah. is next time you go to the doctor. Um, is ask for an iron test. They're usually pretty simple, um, mm -hmm. and, and they're not expensive. And so usually most doctors will do them, especially if you tell them that you're a runner and you're training for a marathon or something. Um, definitely recommend it just to get a baseline of where you're at. Um, so that's a great point for, from, yeah, from your side. Yeah, and I, I agree with that too. I think it's really important to have a healthy baseline because mm -hmm. iron's one of those um, minerals where there's kind of an arbitrary range set for what is normal. Right. I know that some of my college teammates had a normal of 12, Mm -hmm. And one day I got tested and I was at 99. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that I am super full of hemoglobin and oxygen carrying capacity or anything like that. Right. 99 is my normal. So if right. I have to come up at 12, I know I'm in trouble. 
right versus the person at 12 is feeling really good because that's their normal mm-hmm. so um just find you're right finding out what that is will be a really good thing um to determine whether or not you have some issues going on um and then I, the next supplement um that made that i thought about today since our, our um sun is going down earlier weather is getting colder i live up here in the north in minnesota and so we start to um, think about vitamin D. Mm-hmm. Uh, vitamin D, we can make it ourselves when we're exposed to sun. Um, for people who are fair skin, they only need about 15 minutes of sun exposure a day. People with darker okay. skin, um, more like 30 minutes a day. And that's without sunscreen. Um, okay. That would be enough to help us meet our vitamin D needs. But now that the sun is going down earlier, we're not spending as much time outside. Um, our vitamin D levels are, might start to drop because we're not getting that sun exposure. Okay. It, sometimes we don't do a great job at getting vitamin D through food sources either. So vitamin D might be another one of those things to think about supplementing again after talking to your doctor or your pharmacist. Um, but it, it's another popular um, supplement. And a lot of times you'll find it with calcium. Okay. Um, vitamin D and calcium work together to strengthen bone. Um, and so calcium is another popular supplement for, for runners and um, my word of caution with that is um, as with all vitamins and minerals there's an upper tolerable limit that we don't want to exceed and with calcium it's a little bit lower than I even expected it to be it's 2,500 milligrams a day okay and um, recommendations can be anywhere from a thousand to thirteen hundred milligrams a day just depending on um, your gender and your age um, so usually somewhere within that range you're doing good and that adds up pretty quickly through dairy products and uh-huh. um, even some vegetables. And if you look to um, even orange juice and fruit juices are fortified with calcium. A lot of grain products are fortified with calcium. So we do get calcium from a lot of sources. It's not just milk. Uh-huh. And I think one common thing too, will a lot of my clients, is um, they don't tolerate lactose very well. Okay. Um, pretty common. Um, lactose being the sugar in milk. Um, my first recommendation is to try the lactate, lactate, lactose free products. Um, and I actually do that myself. I have lactose free milk just so I can make sure it tastes the same as regular milk. Mm-hmm. And, um, <laughs> so I, I think that's a great product and you can get a lot of things lactose free. Okay. Um, and so calcium supplements aren't exactly necessary, even if you are not a huge dairy fan, because you might do an okay job at actually doing that. Um, If you do take a calcium supplement, um, I recommend no more than 1,000 milligrams a day. Okay. Splitting that apart into 500 milligrams twice a day. Okay. And that will give you the best absorption then. And and then you don't really want to go over that. Okay. Um, Some of the symptoms of having too much calcium, one of the huge ones is um, constipation. So nobody really wants that. Right, right. <laughs> so you don't want to overdo the calcium and, and end up with that as a side effect. And also, you don't want to promote kidney stone formation. Okay. Um, nobody wants those either. Right. Never had <laughs> but I heard that they're not very common. So, um, and then I guess the big one is the multivitamin then. Um, in general, a multivitamin is going to be pretty safe. Um, if you are going to take one, you want to look for one that only has a hundred percent of everything, like nothing super boasted, like a 500% or anything like that. Okay. Um, and what you're probably going to see is that it's mostly going to come out in the urine. Your urine, you know, might be a, a different tinge of yellow or, um, kind of like a green or something like that. That's just the vitamins and minerals coming out because you didn't need them. Mm-hmm. So, um, a lot of people will call a multivitamin an insurance policy which is fine, fine to call it that way. You can take it or leave it, but I, the one thing I just don't like to see is taking a vitamin, a multivitamin in place of saying, okay, now I don't need to eat such right. a healthy diet. Yeah, so, that makes sense. Yeah, cool. I think that's that for those. Cool. Well, that I think that's covered, uh, you know, all the questions that we've had, um, okay. at least that were submitted to us for, for now. Um, so just for, for people that are listening, um, whether, you know, definitely... Uh, Find us on Facebook, or, or I guess like us on Facebook, and um, and follow us on Twitter because every uh, I think we'll continue to do this for our next couple of interviews. Is uh, ask some specific questions that you may have, so we can get a better, you know, make sure that the guests are answering questions that you actually have, and, and kind of going from there. 
Um, but uh, just, I guess, to close up, Emily, talk a little bit about, you know, the nutrition consulting that you do as part of Runners Connect. Um, you know, how is that, um, you know, how does that exactly work? Uh, what type of clients do you typically work with? Um, I work with just about anybody. Um, my favorite clients are people that are really pumped up about running and just looking to see improvements not only in their performance, but also their health. Like I said earlier, I got into public health because I think that um, nutrition is really important um, in our society in general. And I find that the healthier people are, people are the happier people are. And happy people are, are fun to be around. Mm -hmm. So um, what, I, what people can expect from me with nutrition counseling is to work with what you're already doing. I don't okay. want to make any huge changes in your life unless there are huge changes you want to make. But I like to keep it simple convenient and accessible without costing a ton of money or, or making some huge changes or anything like that. Um, another thing I find is a lot of people have families and their families don't want to go through drastic changes with the foods they're eating. <laughs> right. So little kids, they don't want to be on diets in the household and, and find a way to really optimize nutrition centered around your workouts to give you the best, um, fueling solutions, um, for your workouts and, and to help you get race ready and have um, big PRs, hopefully. Okay, great. Um, so for people that are interested, um, we'll throw up a link again at the bottom of this interview, but uh, if you're interested in, in getting in consultation with Emily, you can visit runnersconnect.net backslash running dash nutrition, and that'll give you all the info about Emily, about what she does, her background, um, as well as the, the pricing and stuff like that. Um, and if you have any questions, definitely feel free to email us. Um, you can post a comment at the bottom of this interview, um, and we'll definitely get to you. Or if you have a question about whether Emily can work with you, if you're somebody that she can work with, uh, definitely let us know, and, and she'll get back to you about whether you know she thinks that you'd be a good fit. Um, so Emily, thanks very much for taking the time. I know this went a little bit long, but I appreciate you you know taking the time out of your day to answer nutrition questions, and uh, hopefully we'll have you back on sometime to uh, to answer some more and and uh, keep giving out awesome advice. This was a really great interview. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's good no to problem. see you. <laughs> thanks. Take care. Thanks.